Right, OK, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Digital Transformation Session. Uh, my name's Martin Fullard. I'm the Editorial Director at MASH Media, overseeing uh, some of your favourite magazines, including Conference News, Exhibition News, and just about all of them, I think. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the digital space, how it's transforming our industry, trying to tackle some of the buzzwords, and looking forward to perhaps new innovations as well. So we're going to ramble on between ourselves for a little while. <laughs> Then we're going to want to hear your questions as well, and then there will be an activity workshop at the end as well. So no one gets away from it scot-free. Now, there is a, uh, a film crew here. These are my teammates. Uh, they're most, mostly going to be filming us on stage, uh, not necessarily the audience. But if anyone absolutely categorically doesn't want to find themselves even in B-roll, please do let the video team know before the end. I'm sure otherwise you're all... Totally here legitimately. Uh, so I'm joined by uh, Eb Adieri and Callum Gill, who I'm now going to ask just to quickly introduce themselves in a bit more detail. Eb, maybe you could just tell a little bit about yourself to the audience. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Martin says, I'm Eb Adieri, um, VP for Growth and Alliances at uh, a company called Jellyfish. Uh, we're a digital agency. Uh, we're actually based in the Shard here, a few floors down. So it took me a very long time to, to get here today. Um, I am responsible for the work that we do with a lot of the big platforms, Facebook, Snap, Google. Uh, so I have a vested interest in, in understanding like what's the next platform of social technology, of computer technology. Uh, and I have an opinion on most things when it comes to technology. I have an opinion on most things when it comes to anything, actually. But I will only leave you with my technology opinion today. Uh, I'm Callum, uh, Callum Gill, Head of Insight at DRPG. Um, so I look after both traditional research projects and uh, um, kind of um, forecasting and, and delving into the data for the clients that we work with. But then with my other hat, I'm, responsibility, I'm responsible for agency innovation. So whilst I also look at what technologies we are going to employ, how we're going to manage the in encroachment of digital into the event space as we have done for many, many years, and also which strategies are best for our clients as a result of that. So it's all about making recommendations about the platforms that they should use amongst a myriad of platforms that you have available, understanding the UK use case and understanding the strategic implications. So hopefully I can talk a little bit about the uh, opportunities and pitfalls that we've seen uh, across those various spaces. Great, thank you very much, guys. Now, obviously, the last couple of years has been uh, incredibly testing for a lot of people in the what we would call the traditional events industry. And there's obviously been a shift, certainly in attitudes, generally across the board. Uh, but certainly, if nothing else, we're now more aware of digital opportunity. And I think that what was once the only way to do things can now be complemented by a variety of other different ways. And I think that this is a really important thing to remember. There's no one right way of doing things. It all does come down to sort of understanding uh, what your audience wants and, and how best to engage them, I guess. You know, there's your, there's your top tip already. But as you would expect, uh, we've been bombarded with a blizzard of buzzwords, uh, some of which we don't really know what they mean. Some of them sound like Ponzi schemes, some of them sound like gimmicks. Uh, we have no idea. So I think, why don't we start with, uh, with an easy one? Uh, we're all starting to hear words like metaverse, or is it metaverse? I don't know if anyone's uh, <laughs> hot on their Greek. Uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. I still don't know what the word fungible means. Immersive tech. I mean, these are, these are three that, that come to mind. So maybe, Eb, we could start with you. How would you define those three? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and some of them are actually Ponzi schemes as well. So like, let's, let's start off with that. Um, I think the, 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 if you look at the Google search of like metaverse, like that kind of really kind of blew up. I mean, it, it, I think it first came, it was first invented probably like, it's probably 1992. There was a story called Snow Crash. A guy talked about metaverse and then no one really said anything. And then obviously when Facebook rebranded to like metaverse, the metaverse really kind of became a bit of a thing. And when I kind of, define it as those things. I think we're in that stage where the metaverse itself at the moment isn't really defined by anyone. It's become a catch-all term for everything that takes into a case augmented reality, virtual reality, these non-fungible tokens, crypto. It's become a catch-all term for all these things. It's slowly morphing into, well, when I say metaverse, what I really mean is virtual reality. Although, Actually, some of the proponents behind it would say there's a lot more to it than that. 
Um, so I think we're, we're kind of at the stage where the, the definitions themselves are still to be worked out. Um, I think the example that, that I tend to, call, to tend to harp back on is if you go back to sort of the, the 90s, the mid-90s or the 2000s, when people described the internet as the information superhighway. And that's the way everyone talked about it. It's like the information superhighway. And the internet then sort of became the, the lexicon that everyone kind of used. I think we're kind of at that stage yet, this stage. What will the metaverse look like in 20 years' time? I don't know. I think the definitions are still to be worked out. Um, but I think the important takeaway I would have from that is really to try and, to try and understand what, they, what it actually means. Which bit is a Ponzi scheme versus which bit can we actually use for our day-to-day -day business? Um, we're at the early stage, so back to your early question, like how I define it, uh, I, I think it is that, is a catch-all term. Um, it may well change, it may well just be become a virtual reality space on these things. Um, but I think the, def the definitions are still fluid and I don't think we'll see anything settled on that for a few years to come. I'll get your opinion in just a second, Callum, but I think that's, that, that, that's really interesting, like the metaverse as a concept. You know, hands up, has anyone here had a colleague or a superior or a board member say, oh, we need to get on the metaverse? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what even is that? I mean, it's, uh, it, people seem to think there has been this understanding that it's this, this you know, parallel universe somewhere yeah. where we're all avatars that already exist, but that is perhaps somewhat of a misunderstanding. It's, it's far away into the future, that piece, for sure. And that piece will exist exactly as we've just heard in virtual reality without a shadow of a doubt. Right now, where you can broaden the scope of metaverse um, platforms, if you like, is to anywhere where, where, or I would say, where people are interacting in a digital space, yeah. trying to replicate um, the interactions that you can have in real world environments however um, exaggerated those interactions might, might be. So that includes um, Horizon, obviously, Workspaces, which is the workplace, Facebook's internal version of, of Horizon, but also all your children's favorite computer games and, and everything in between, Roblox, Fortnite, Apex Legends. Um, then you've got uh, monetized versions in the space, things like Decentraland, Sandbox, where you can actually buy physical land in these virtual spaces. And at the moment, not all of them require virtual entrance through virtual reality, but in the future they will do. And <clears throat> to highlight the point that, that you just made, Martin, so one of a client was talking with, uh, unnamed client was talking with one of our sales rep, and they were messaging me at the same time saying, they want us to build a metaverse platform for them. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like We can build like, virtual exhibition centers and auditoriums and stuff like that. We have single entrance and people can go around and mill around and look at stuff. And so what kind of functionality do they want to have? And it's like, well, we want everybody to be able to walk around and navigate it with some sort of avatar. We want those avatars to be able to interact with each other. And we want the fidelity and graphical quality to be really good. And I was like, so you want to develop a computer game? Basically, that's that. And they were like, how long would it take? How much? And I was like, a billion quid, three years. <laughs> so th there is a lot like a level of understanding which sort yeah. of needs to be unpicked to understand where you're going to go in. And why would you do that when exactly as you just heard, all of these players are plowing loads and loads of money into platforms that you can access already. Places like Horizon, like Decentraland. Um, in terms of NFTs, I mean, I think NFTs are, this is the, this is the dawn of what that means and why it's important. So at the moment, it's just basically collecting internet ephemera. Yeah. So, you know, like the picture of the original picture of the DeLorean sold for a couple of million quid the other day, um, and someone just owns that now. It's owned on the blockchain, so it's verifiable, but forever there is nothing stopping me from doing a presentation and putting that picture of the DeLorean up in my presentations. So the concept of ownership is fuzzy there. What will happen is these things, especially for events, will become access enablers. So if you own an NFT, that will get you into the VIP area of an event. That will get you special treatment at the event. That will get you access to a specific track of information or whatever it is. And that stuff is starting to happen already. So you can look at players in the market like Gem, who have started introdu introducing the fact that when you buy their NFT, you get 25% off at Amazon for life. So real sudden value interactions happen. Big problem, Ponzi scheme element, all tied to crypto <laughs> currency, completely fluctuating, no centralized platform. So we were talking to Jaguar Land Rover the other day about exactly this fact, and we were like, we want to mint 250 NFTs for our, for our new range of cars. And it's like, okay, give us the address of your crypto wallet and talk to us about how much Bitcoin you've got. And they all looked at us like, uh, it's like, yes, you have to pay in cryptocurrency for those things. So if you're not there yet, or you haven't sorted out that strategic piece, which is risky, 
that is risky for organizations, then you need to get clients, customers, whoever come to your events to mint their own NFTs and therefore they have to be original. There are solutions to all, all these things, but the biggest point I think and the link between NFT and metaverse will be in the future your NFT will be your entrance to the metaverse. So it will contain all of the information about you, all the clothes you've bought in the metaverse, all the cars that you own in the metaverse. So when you go onto Horizon, or when you jump onto another video game platform, you will be able to take all your stuff with you. And until that happens, I don't think we've got a true metaverse, yeah. really. I'm not gonna lie, I'm struggling to get my head around that. <laughs> uh, so just to spare anyone else the embarrassment. But I mean, I, I understand as a, as a concept, it's just when you say buying things in the metaverse, is yeah. that basically just my credit card bill from Amazon and, you know, they can see what I've been up to. That's basically my blockchain, my my purchasing Your history wallet. of items mm -hmm. I'm getting in real life. Or if I'm not, I'm not going to spend 300 grand on a Ferrari in the metaverse and only have a computer version of it. If I'm spending 300 <laughs> grand, I want to drive it. So this is, the, this is the thing, right? So Gucci, Gucci Gardens in Roblox, perfect yeah. example. There's a bag in there with a little B on it. In the real world, it costs $900. In Roblox, it costs $1,200. That's a digital version of it. They sell six times as many of the digital versions as they do of the real versions. So yeah. now, what does that mean? Do we need to know why to know that it's happening? Or do, and do we need to strategize because we know it's happening? I will never do that. I am too old. I'm 37 years old and I'm way too old for that. But I know people are doing it. So but I'm going to tell my clients, right? Yeah, but I think it, it, it just takes that notion of like ownership and like Gucci can do that because their brand's been built offline. Ferrari can do that. Adidas and, and, and Nike have their own sort of, um, their own metaverse equivalents. You know, Nike brought Reflective. Uh, they can do that because they've built their brands offline. Not everyone can start online and say, right, this is it. This is what my brand's going to be. Now, there may be, there may be over time when the metaverse, whatever it is, becomes a thing where my daughter might say, actually, all my friends are really interested in this particular space. Like even like, Ro like Roblox, it kind of goes on at the moment where there are certain things that are valuable because a lot of people who are inter inter interacting with that think that's valuable. I might not have a clue. I might be like, really? you want to spend 900 quid on that? Like, what is that? And they're like, well, I've got this, like my friends will get it. But, that, but that's the notion of value. And I think that's probably where, when you say buying things in the metaverse, you know, if there are enough people that think something's valuable, it's valuable. Um, and that's kind mm. of how, how it will kind of come about. But in the context of engagement, or should we say, you know, immersive tech, I mean, you know, we're seeing some really interesting examples out there in the real, real world. And if I may use something like sport as an example, yeah. you know, uh, it's happening in Formula One now with their new owners. They're much more open to different concepts. But Formula E, the electric uh, racing yeah. series, is quite an interesting one. And you know, you can the fans can vote online to give drivers a power boost and things like that. And it's it's all a bit like a real life computer game <laughs> as it is. But I mean, is, does that constitute part of the metaverse? You know, or is that perhaps more of a what's the word? More of an immersive hybrid element. I think I, I think I think it kind of depends because I, again to, back to my earlier point of like the definition of the metaverse it's very easy to capture all these things in once I think if there's something new that's kind of happening and fan kind of engagement I mean I I, I don't know is the answer you know we, we we get our Saturday night TVs that people can like text in for like who they want to win like is that a different dynamic on that well the tools are probably different that you, you could kind of have that with things like that so you know it may be that the the, the tools will be, be slightly different um when everyone has their sort of you know nft wallet the tools that you have may be slightly different the dynamics will be different we all have mobile phones now so we're all able to to text in our response or text in so the tools are slightly different i think from a brand perspective just understanding the dynamics and the tool and understanding the audience. Like if everyone has an NFT wallet, there's different things you can do and there's different things that it enables you to do. But at the moment, not many people kind of have them. So it's slightly limited by that. But I, I would say to any brand, like really kind of like observe where this is kind of going, uh, know what it is your brand really stands for and can do and where you sit within the chain. Like. Not everything that Nike or Adidas or these people could do, you could do as a brand. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, to the point of engagement, we will start to see more of those things as more people kind of come online. 
And if you want to look at who, there's, there's a sliding scale of who has to be there now and who, has, who can take a longer view. And you've heard some of the names already. So we're talking fashion, sport, luxury. Yeah. Those are the three areas that have to be there now. Their audience is there now. That's where they're making engagements now. And if they don't, all of their competitors are there now. So they'll be left behind. That's why all of these guys are rushing in, getting into metaverse spaces and trying and testing things. Mm. And if you look at any kind of digital methodology for, a, for immersion or engagement, you have to test and fail. And, that's, and that, that's a big risk for a lot of people, right? Is to sit back and go, do you know what? This might fail. I'm going to have to spend a lot of money developing something. But the great thing is, is say in like an event, event environment, if it yeah. fails, that's a lot of money that's disappeared. In the digital environment, you've got the basis of something that you can then build on or reiterate at a lot less cost. Um, I think in terms of immersion for events, what you described there, Fan Boost, as it's called, we worked on that with um, Jaguar Land Rover, who are also having um, big problems deciding how they sell stuff in the metaverse. Should they sell their 120 grand Range Rovers for 120 grand in the metaverse? Like, because it's not quite the same as fashion, is it? And the problem that they've got there is that people are already building really high fidelity copies of their vehicles in mm -hmm. metaverse spaces without their, without their say so, without their licensing. Yeah. So, you know, these dangers encroach on it as well. But I think from an engagement point of view, what it's got to be about for events is the human being aspect of it. So that's either the human person who's in a room or the avatar that's in a, in a space. How do they connect? What can they do with each other and how can they interact with each other? Because um, I think, you know, in that fan boost example, unless then as a result of that they are in the live space afterwards, it's sort of just a digital engagement piece. But if there's some way to put them in some kind of virtual bleachers at the side of the track through virtual reality, mm -hmm. then we're talking about a metaverse experience between events and the, and the digi digital space. And um, people are looking at this technology now. So a Microsoft HoloLens is, is probably the best place to look at that today. So they do this thing called holoportation. So they can transport someone from one room across the planet into another room virtually as long as you're wearing mixed reality glasses. Yeah. They just tested it in a moving car and it worked. So you could bring a speaker in to this stage and sit with us as long as everybody in the audience is wearing mixed reality glasses. He would be here, but he'd be sitting in his car driving to the airport or whatever. And um, I was at an event for a pharmaceutical company this morning where I was talking about data and the use of it. And they interviewed a clinician, an oncologist, who basically told them, well, before the pandemic, if you'd have asked me to come to this event, I might have ummed and ah ahed about it and eventually said yes for this hour long slot. He came in virtually. He said, if you'd asked me now, I would have said no. I would have said a flat no, I'm not traveling that length of time yeah. to come to your event to speak for an hour. But I'll definitely do it on the, uh, on the virtual piece, 100%. You've got me straight away. So that dynamic is normalized now. How do we elevate it? Because that's the responsibility as event organizers is to elevate those experiences and, not, and to basically say that bringing someone in on a Teams call even though it's permitted, is not good enough for events. We can raise the bar so we can look at metaverse interactions to yeah. facilitate that. Well, this all comes down to actually, you know, as a business, and I think you know, this is what the events industry broadly sometimes gets wrong, is that we've got to help our clients, our brands, understand their business objective, not just yeah. the event objective, because the event should be a, a part of a wider business strategy. So it's helping people understand their actual business objective and then of course you can work backwards to establish which technology might be best best to use. I mean that's the, the that's the starting point isn't it? Pretty yeah much. it is it is I, I mean I, I, you know we run events our clients run events and it is about like well what what does that what's the objective for that and and I think one thing that, that Callum says I definitely definitely completely uh, sort of chime with is the innovation that clients are kind of looking for from the events people is like, okay, now you have to give a particular reason to bring people together. And in terms of like raising the bar, it's just like, okay, uh, I can't just bring people together because that's what we've always done. Like it, the, the economics don't really kind of like work out, um, but we still need to kind of put these kind of events on. You know, we need to kind of raise the bar. And, and I think that, that aspect of innovation, actually what, what might have started off as innovation maybe before the pandemic, is now becoming kind of like necessity. It's like actually to that point, like the HoloLens example, someone was like brought in, you know, sorry, the, um, the, where someone's like brought in as a, as a hologram. That's a perfect example where 
you know, you look forward five, six years time, it may be that that's the, the unit economics you need for certain types of events. And that's kind of, you know, what's the charging model behind that? And, and like all of that aspects there. And like, that's just the way things are going to go, I think. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Do we see any sort of parallels to the disruptive tech of old? You know, have we, what, what's happened in the past that we can maybe learn from as we sort of go on this journey? I mean, the idea of once upon a time even using social media for an event yeah. like this was, you know, the <laughs> fevered dream of a madman. Well, I, 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 so I, I, like 10 years ago, I'm a lot, I'm a lot older than I look, but um, I remembered, yeah, yeah, I know. I remember the days of, like, so all the questions you kind of get asked now, like, What's social media going to mean for like our event? Like, do we need to have, <laughs> do we need to have a tweet wall so that people can kind of engage with us? And we were like, yeah, we need to have a tweet wall. And then people will start like tweeting profanities and like, yeah, we need to get rid of the tweet wall because it's definitely <laughs> not the thing to do. But but all that aspect around social media where people are like, oh, is this something we need to do? And I remember at the time we was pizza clients were like, it's 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 like it's like it's like teenage sex. Everyone's talking about it. No one's actually doing it. <laughs> and it's like that. I think one of the parallels we can we can draw from that now is like everyone's talking about the metaverse and NFTs. Not many people are doing it in this space. What can we learn from it? I, I, I come back to like learning more about where you are as a business and what it is you're about and where you sit within that chain and that, that point of like fashion, um, sport, like those categories where your audience is already there. Like learning who you are as a business before you kind of like jump in on things. I always say that to clients because it's very easy to like be inspired by what's going on out there and thinking it applies to you. It doesn't always apply to you, but you can learn from like what's kind of going on there. So it might sound like a bit of a lazy cop out answer, but what we can learn is like you can learn from like what other people are doing and then map it down to like how you kind of sit, sit as a business, um, whether your events are in any other category. Do you want to add anything to that, Callum? I think, I think there's two areas. Social media is one, like, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, like, look at how that entered into the space. Now, if you look at where we are in terms of a more mature approach, uh, well, I mean, I say that, but I still do countless audits of communications today where I discover a Facebook channel that is totally and utterly superfluous to the organisation's needs that was probably set up in 2007 just because, and they're engaging with no one there because they're a B2B enterprise. Yeah. So it's like, why are you just focusing on LinkedIn and Twitter? Yeah. And I think a lot of us in this room know that inherently now, these things, what the channels are for, what the plat platforms are for. And that's a model for development in terms of the various platforms that we've got in the metaverse. And then the other thing is apps, the simple, humble app, when they came around in events, you had two camps right at the beginning, I say back in 2007, 2008. No, we're not doing any apps, it's ridiculous, it's stupid, people are spending too much time looking yeah. at their phones, or other people, yes, we need an app, but all we're going to do is put the agenda on there and all the stuff that we would get on the <laughs> sheet when people come into the event anyway, and then it doesn't work, and then the response back to the agency is apps don't work, yeah. even though they would then turn around and use their phone and go on all their apps, you know, that kind of cognitive dissonance. But um, it's the same thing here. You might hear Roblox, you might hear Horizon, you might hear workspaces, go, and, and we were talking about this before, go and have a look put on a VR headset, go inside, have a look around, walk around, take a tour and figure out whether or not any of it fits for your business. Because if you take like the, like the Fortnite example, they've monetized their proposition really, really well. Travis, the Travis Scott gig was the largest event in the world ever. Like some of us in here might not be happy to use that definition of event, people playing a computer game. 29.3 million people watched it simultaneously. They all logged in, they all talked to one another, you know, while they were in there with their groups of friends, 29.3 million people. Now, for your types of events, engaging customers, do you want to build something in Fortnite? Don't know, probably not. But some people at this point in time are jumping in there and going, let's just get, let's just get in any platform now as quickly as we possibly can and, you know, sort of make a splash. And those kind of precursor brands we've just talked about yeah. are going to do that and they're going to fail in some spaces or they're going to have really good successes like Gucci. Like Ralph Lauren went into Roblox and built a snow lodge in there and it failed, but Gucci Gardens was a huge success. You know, these kind of things will happen. Um, and it's about exactly, exactly that. Think about who you are, who your audience is and what you need to serve to them. And first and foremost, position experience at the center of it, because it doesn't matter that it's a digital platform. Digital experience is comparable yeah. to real world experience and you have to create excellence in both. And events uh, professionals are very good at creating that in-person excellence and experience. You just got to think about the same theory and design yeah. theory for the digital and I think space. I think with that, like the expectation now is kind of like raised in terms of like the experience, what you can get away with. 
Um, I think before, you know, poor graphics, like things like, well, yeah, you can probably get away, you can't get away with it now right. because the expectation has been raised in other parts of the world. So actually that experience actually really counts for a lot now because of all these other players who've pretty much raised everyone's, everyone's expectations. That's it, spend two and a half million quid and then the Wi-Fi goes down and the <laughs> yeah. whole thing becomes exactly. completely <laughs> redundant. I mean, I can, I can say on that as well, I will not mention um, how this happened, but basically someone's head was turned by the promise of a uh, kind of digital engagement metaverse platform uh, that promised, you know, promised the, 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 the giddy heights of computer gaming. Um, and um, it was deployed at an event which had significant infrastructure linkage to BT and their emergency network servicing. And it was basically, this system required people with PC gaming quality machines to access it. No one had done their research or looked at it and they almost crashed 999. They like almost crashed 999 by doing it. Goodness me, who do you call in that emergency? Well, BT, BT solved it straight away. So yeah. that's Thank you know, Good old British Telecom. <laughs> they know what they're doing. So if part of our goal then really is you know, marketing leads as they are everyone in this room, uh, you know, the top of their list is to build communities. And it's great that you've touched on the, the app issue already because, you know, I've been around for a few years now and apps, apps, apps are all the rage mm -hmm. for conferences, for trade shows, you name it. I can't remember the last time I downloaded an app and well, quite frankly, most venue Wi-Fi is pretty appalling anyway, so they nev never really sort of work. Uh, but when it comes to building communities, I see at the moment people generally tend to go where the people are. So social media channels, LinkedIn would yeah. be obviously a very good example of where we start from. Uh, you know, there's obviously been a huge rise in WhatsApp groups, which yeah. I personally find absolutely lamentable because they <laughs> chirp at all hours of the day. Uh, and then of course, you know, you look at something like the Delegate Wranglers Facebook group. I mean, Neil could have taken that anywhere. You know, he could have created his own platform and done all of that, but no, he went to where the people were. Yeah. And, you know, that made him easily findable, so to speak. So really, I guess the, the question is, is the metaverse concept really going to be where we're going to be building and engaging with our communities going forward? Uh, I'd, say, I'd say yes and yes, and, and, but not yes as in it's easy to do. Um, are the people there to do it? I think communities, like people, we're inherently lazy. Like if I if I if I can just like if I tell my friends like yeah we're just there already if it's I don't have to go to an extra site an extra login and I'm like that's great I, I always remember someone said to me like well what's the what's the Facebook of like dog walkers it's Facebook <laughs> yeah that's the thing it's just like where people are and I think like if there are many people in the metaverse it's that's the place to build communities because the the hard bit about community building and I'm sure Callum probably could speak much better about this than I can. The hard bit about community building is like keeping that shared sense of like what you're bringing together. Like the easy part, easy part, is is like where are the people? The hard bit is like, okay, keeping them together. Like I, I'm a part of a Facebook group um, of very cynical marketeers. And a cynical marketeer. A cynical no. marketeers who hate Facebook no, and we, and we cover less on it. Facebook. <laughs> that is the thing. But the hard bit is just keeping it going. And I think when you like building communities, like if, if, you know, will Metaverse be the place where we build communities? I'm sure there will be. There will be some communities within there. And, and it depends on the amount of effort that, that you kind of get in there. What, what's the inherent value that you're having to have a Metaverse community? It may not even be called Metaverse community. It, it, it will be something in there. Like, I don't know, people who own an NFT of Jaguar Land Rovers or whatever it is there. So, um, so the answer to that is yes, but it's not a straightforward. Because on, on a base level right now, I mean, you can join any membership organisation, you know, if you're a chartered professional or something like that, yeah. or, you know, you can go and log into your special f uh, platform. You know, they've got the website, there's a forum there and all of that that probably had the same six people just posting on it all the time. <laughs> it's quite labour intensive to yeah. sort of manage and engage a yeah. community yeah. at the moment. So. Yeah. You know, considering that we're still, you know, we're going to be using laptops and phones and tablets and all of that sort of thing. Uh, it just seems to me like I, ca I can't see how people would be any more incentivized to use things like a metaverse where there might be an avatar roaming around and you could engage. Yeah. When really there are similar, quite basic products now where you can do similar things engaging, but people generally don't do that. Yeah. They, they, they keep their conversations on the mainstream social media channels because that's where everybody is. Yeah. There's three, three core components, right? So there's te technological, societal, 
and then tactical. So that's that's you asking how we can get leads or generate in interest. So technological, we need technological advancement. I mean, there was like a hundred di different measures over the pandemic. One said twenty-three years worth of advancement. One said seven. Pick a number in between. Who cares? You can assume some rate of development, right? So that means these technologies that we're talking about. Uh, like the headset that's just over there, I don't know. Oh yeah, if anyone that. wants to have a go on the VR, um, come speak to me afterwards. Just don't walk too close to the window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that technology has to become ubiquitous or easy. There has to be some kind of overlay on it. And then the big players who are already building in that space, particularly arts, entertainment and culture, who are the, who are the precursors for a lot of this, need to intersect it into our lives. And, and they will do, because it's a medium they can use it, and really creative people always do really great things with mediums like this. When that happens, then we're at the point, the tipping point, where now most people will be there, or they will be going in there, and then you will see real value. But again, then it's gonna be about what can we do as an events community to innovate in that space and to do things differently. And what we have that a lot of these digital platforms, like pure digital places, do not have is the ability to integrate it with a real world experience at the same time. And that is something which is gonna be hyper valuable to specifically lower Generation Z and Generation Alpha audiences who are going to come into this space. Is that the next one, Generation Alpha? Generation oh, Alpha, yes, they've started. Full circle. Gone full circle to Greek, the Greek <coughs> alphabet now because they've run out of other letters. Right. That's, <laughs> that's where it tends to get to. Alpha, they're born from what now? Ninety, like, like 99 or 2000 or something like that, I think. Or even later, slightly later. Very strange. They're in high school, basically, right now in the UK. Um, but it's only going to take about 30 years for them to be one of the biggest demographics that we need to market to, communicate with, and who are going to enter into our space. Um, what, what will their preferences be based on this stuff that we're talking about? It's slightly going to be metaverse. It is likely going to be metaverse. Yeah. So we, can't, we can't dismiss it. But how can we add value there? Well, those two generations uh, value experience over anything else. They've thrown away the old wealth interaction dynamics. They don't care about what watch. They do care about trainers. That is something that they do care about. I do too, so I pick up on that. Um, they don't care about you know what watch you have, what car you drive. They care about how many festival wristbands you have on your wrist, and they care about what holiday snaps you can put on Instagram and stuff like that. They value experience. So this myth that they or they will spend all their time in their computers and they never look up from the screen is nonsense. And in fact, when they're doing that, they're communicating with people. And they'll communicate with more people, that generation, before the age of 15 than we will with in our whole lives because of the, the rate of digital acceleration. They're very communicative, they engage, they're very social. Pretending that they're just buried in a dark room and not engaging with people is, is a bit blind. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing that goes, Hand, hand, hand in hand with that is assuming that it's just them in that space now. The average age of people playing around in the metaverse, as we were discussing before, yeah. is about 35. So, oh, it's my kids. My kids do it. That was, it's, not, it's not really that. So if they build it, we will come is, is you know, one of the strategies. But the reality is, is that people are just going to emerge into that space and we'll have to target them there. So let's innovate in the space now so that we're ready, mm. so that we can join those conversations and do something interesting for them that they haven't seen before. I think one of the only interesting things that from a marketing agency uh, aspect, and we, we're like moving away more from like demographic focus, like targeting sort of behavioral targeting, like. I have friends who do, even in their mid 40s, are like buried down in their phones. I have others who are like, you know, even young, young people, my cousins, like again, very studious. And I have people, I, you know, my grandma, my grandma, like, like so my headset on there, so there's, there's an app on there, like basically it simulates a, um, a roller coaster. Uh, my youngest, my sister in law put it on, was screaming like a bunch. She was sat on the chair. Ah! My grandma puts it on and we think, oh my God, are we going to kill grandma because she's putting this thing on? She's just there, just chilling. I was like, oh, she's really cool. I like this stuff. <laughs> so I think demographically, it's there, but it's more behavioral. And I think you will find people, irrespective of their age, who are a certain type. And I think, we, that, and I think that's the thing to kind of understand with some of the new technologies, that actually we're all different people. And whether you are a 25-year-old, you may be studious, you may be conscientious, you might be a 60-year-old, you might be open-minded. And as a, as a marketing agency, that's how we're starting to look to kind of target people now. Like what is, what is kind of pushing them? What, is, what, you know, what are their inherent like, um, preferences that they, that they have? 
Um, and I and I think like that's the way to kind of think about like some of these kind of like immersion immersive tech um, it's, it, and it, building community. As it, well. It's clear then, you know, technology is you know it's not going anywhere. It was uh, it's oh, no, only going no. to advance. It's only going in one direction. Uh, but you know, a lot of people in the room here today, are, I'm sure, will be still sitting there thinking, well, you know, wh wh where next? Wh wh where do I? put my pen to paper? How do I take the next step? Where do I go and explore? If I want to explore this concept of an immersive world, a metaverse where I can create a communities, what advice can we give people in the audience? Where should they go next? First thing, come and see me afterwards. Have a go on the headset. It will blow your mind. I'll get you on the roller coaster aspect, unless you don't like roller coasters. Um, but but on, a, on a more serious point, um, I, I think that's that's probably the kind of the entry point. Um, like it's very difficult to kind of describe the experiences on these things. People ask me like, what's it like on like the headsets? I'm like, you kind of have to like experience it. And if there's opportunities to kind of experience it, like that would be my first kind of like touch point on these things. Because then like people take away different different things when they when they kind of experience it. Like some people go in there and their preference is to go on like the 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 dinosaur app or the dinosaur experience there. Some people do something different. My advice would be where you can try and experience it. There's, there is a lot written about it. There's a lot of horseshit written about it as well. Um, and try and separate like the wheat from the chaff. Like, that would be my, my, my first yeah. takeaway anyway. So the tech, go in and have a play around on a metaverse platform is absolutely the first piece of advice. You need to see it for yourself before you st start thinking about a wider strategy. But there's a good example from Charlie Brooker, um, who wrote Black Mirror, um, <laughs> who does Newswipe and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And if you, you're aware of the platform Twitch, it's the biggest yeah. computer game streaming platform on the planet. And he was like, oh, this is something that my kids do. He loves computer games, right? But he was still looking at that and going, well, what is this? Like, why would anyone want to watch other people playing computer <laughs> games? Like, I don't get it. And then he sat down and watched it and he asked his son, why do you like this? Like, what, what is it for you? And he says, oh, because I get to do this, that or the other. But as he was listening to it, he was like, this is just radio. Like, Charlie Brooker loves radio. And he's like, there's a presenter he really likes. He's listening to him talk. Yeah, he's watching something at the same time, but it's just radio. That's all it is. I get it now. I can do this with him. And this is, this is, these are the kind of like light bulb moments where you can start looking at this as not an alien technology, but something that's really familiar with you, to you if you start to find access points. So if you've got kids, talk to them about why they do it. Why do they spend $900 on a bag? <laughs> like why, you know, it's the smaller things though, like we yeah. were talking about, why do they want that particular kit on FIFA? Yeah. Like, yeah. because it means something to them and their friends or whatever it might be. And then from there, you can start to look at your business strategy and start to go, well, does anything that we do right now today align with, with this? And if it doesn't, then you can say, okay, will it in 10 years? Will it in 20 years? Will it in 30 years? Because in 30 years, it will. Absolutely. You've just got to figure out how. Like, yeah. how, how, is that, how is that point in time going to come about if, you, if all of your audience are in there and buying things in there and interacting in there on a daily basis? If all of your clients in a B2B environment are in there or if their major services are delivered through the metaverse, then you, then you need to be in the metaverse as well or you're going to look irrelevant as a supplier, etc., etc. There's loads of strategic entry points. Um, you want to hit your cart to a horse? Uh, I would say the big sandbox um, uh, metaverse platforms like Decentraland or Sandbox. Yeah. Um, but which one of them is going to win is going to sort of be like VHS, Betamax, that, that kind <laughs> yeah. of environment. I don't think both can survive. Um, Meta will keep on throwing money at yeah. Horizon until yeah. the end of time. Yeah. So Horizon will be around as a platform. And all of the big computer game companies like Fortnite. Fortnite is so big now that it is the first company in the history of the world that took Apple to court and sued them. That's how big they are. Like, they sued them and they won. Like, I mean, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. They threw like 90 billion at it or something. And then they just went and released a bunch of new skins on Fortnite yeah. and made it back in two weeks. Like this, like these platforms have got clout and power. They're not going anywhere. You can start looking at them in that kind of context and go, okay, where would we like to be? Where would we like to play around? Where would we like to have a test? 
It's an interesting concept before we open up to some Q&A, but I was just thinking about this as you were talking. It's like, I don't know if, how well, how au fait everyone in the room is with football, but a few years ago, Burger King sponsored Stevenage. Yes. And if, for those who don't know, Stevenage are not in the Premier League or the Championship or League One. They're very, very low down in League Two. They yeah. get a very small attendance in the stadium, about 1,500 people. Not yeah. a big club, but not a local franchisee. Burger King HQ yeah. were their shirt sponsor. Now you'd normally think that someone of that size would be after Chelsea or Arsenal or Tottenham or someone like that, but no, they went with Stevenage. Why? Because they knew on Football Manager, which is a really popular game you play on your phone, yeah. Stevenage is one of the most popular chosen teams, which you know young people pick up and play with, and they take them through to the Champions League in this computer game, knowing full well that the Burger King logo would be blasted on everyone's screen. So they didn't sponsor the team for the exposure in you know newspapers or the Stevenage Gazette or anything yeah. like that or to the 1500 people who live in Stevenage but it was to yeah. get their brand out there in in a, I guess a metaverse mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah. It's quite an inch. I only discovered yeah. that like last year and I thought yeah. it was absolutely fascinating yeah. and yeah. it worked for them yeah, well it is I mean that, that that's the kind of thing that that's that's a, a good example of a brand thinking from first principles in terms of like where does where do we want to be seen and who's the audience that we want to be seen with? Um, I remember years ago, slightly more not safe for work version, where it was uh, a brand that actually did all the advertising on one of the adult websites, as it were. But again, it comes back from like, where's your brand? What do you want to be seen? And sponsoring a kit in Football Manager and you know understanding like actually why are all these people taking stevenage on there and then like okay well can we just sponsor the kit in like football manager yeah that's why can't we do that and offer them like but like that's taking it from first principles and like understanding like yeah that's a i, I mean burger king done it but there's no reason why any of the other people can do it. and you probably get other people now thinking about that like how can we how can we sponsor a brand wherever that is whether it's on Fortnite. i i know that um the guys at roblox are i don't think they take advertising yet but that may well be something that comes down mm -hmm. the line. Um, I'd say it's a certainty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> but, and that's the thing. It's like when you've got that many people, you've got that many eyeballs, advertising will come. So, you know, we will start looking at like brand, you know, looking at platforms like that. Are there advertising opportunities within there? So it's just like a tiny tangent, but like, I mean, Fortnite have just signed a multi billion pound deal, dollar deal with Jordan, like the sub brand of Nike with Jordans. You can get kitted out in Jordans there. But the Burger King um, agency at CPB in the States out of Colorado are masters of lateral thinking. So that's what they do. They exercise. Have you ever heard of De Bono's hats? His six hats. So that's what they do on every project. They put, the six, put their ideas through the six hats process. So they came up with that. And they also came up with the most successful ad of the last five years, which is the OK Google ad, where they used 15 seconds worth of advertising time to ask Google a question in people's houses. And it worked. So they would say, OK, Google, what is the Whopper? And then the advert would end, but your Google Home would talk to you for 15 seconds about what a Whopper is. And then Google got angry and they changed it. So uh, Burger King uh, released loads of versions with modulated voices so they couldn't track it and it kept on happening. It was the most shared you know, campaign that's ever happened over the past 10 years. Like the amount of publicity they got off it was ridiculous. But I'm only mentioning it because if you want to look at how to, that's looking at jumping into these spaces, right? So they did it in Football Manager. They were like, all right, we put, put it on, the, yeah. on Stephen Hidge's kit and we get into the digital world for free via the back door. Oh, and also, by the way, if we ask Google a question, we get an extra 30 seconds of free advertising yeah. that we don't yeah. pay for. This is the kind of thinking that you can apply to these digital yeah. spaces that will be really valuable strategically, I think. Absolutely, if I really want a Whopper now, <laughs> the system works. Uh, right, okay, Bef before we move to the topics of table discussion, uh, do we have any questions from the floor for Callum or Eb? Felicia, at the back. Hello, thank you so much for this, driving us into the future. I was thinking about my daughter who's asked me for Robux every two minutes, and like, why am I giving you real money for fake money? It doesn't make sense to me, but it's fine. But bringing us back a little bit, because that's far in the future, one thing that we get asked at Cvent quite a bit is about that sort of 3D space, and there's such a debate in our product teams because, and give you my real world, I went to Grand Designs a few weeks ago, walking the floor, speaking to people, what am I going to buy? They do have a virtual 3D tour, and I started, and I was like, 
oh God, I can't be bothered. My quality of time is very important. I personally don't have the time to walk around 3D space to find what I need, where I could just go to the show myself. So I'm, it, it makes me wonder, what is the driver? Why would we take exhibitions and put them into 3D spaces? What is the driver? What is the benefit of that, in your opinion? Because that's something we can do now. Is that something we should be doing now? So when you say 3D spaces, mm -hmm. you, do you mean digital? Because this is so weird. Like, I was speaking to someone today, and I was like, oh, it's good to see you in 3D. And I'm like, oh, because we've been online, like 2D is like the version. So you say 3D. I'm talking you, old money. Like, not like, oh, you've been virtual for so long now, you're actually real. <laughs> I mean, more like, the, I mean the virtual kind of thing. Okay. But nothing to do with goggles. Okay. More, you're on your computer. A very basic. I know, yeah. Like, that's why I thought, we're bringing us back from the future to what's yeah. really basically possible now, because I've seen people do it, and we get customers requesting, and we're like, should we? Is that a thing you really want? Do people <laughs> have time to be walking around the 3D version of Confex? I'm not sure. Is that what you want? I, I guess if customers are asking for it, then I suppose some people do have time for it, um, but it comes down to, like, well, what, what is the point, what, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to showcase of there? It's, uh, it's a bit of a cop-out answer to say, like, it depends on the scenario. But, you know, I, I know within within certain instances, um, during the pandemic, obviously, there was a need to, like, oh, am I going to buy a house because I've only just viewed it through, like, you know, the, my phone or computer? Um, was the experience as good? No, it definitely wasn't. Um, but there are some people where that's, it's kind of like the accepted norm now, the people buying houses without ever, ever, ever kind of seeing them. Um, you know, is it something you should be doing? I, I, I guess it depends on like what you want to kind of get out of it and the experience you kind of want to, to put people kind of through. Um, there's, never, there's never one one answer for these things. Um, but if it doesn't, you know, for, for some brands, it's it's not a thing. Like if you can, I, I'm I'm more on the extrovert scale. I prefer to be in a room with people. I prefer to take the people there. Some people just don't. Um. So um, I would probably come down hard on the side of yes, you should do it. Uh, <clears throat> number of reasons. First of all, you can just go to the show. What about an audience in Australia? You might want to come to the same show to get on a 26-hour flight, whatever it might be. Uh, what about people who are still shielding? or people who have got disabilities and they can't access, this technology has opened up a world of possibilities for them and we become a more inclusive society as a result of it. Um, second, uh, third of all, um, the environmental aspect. So how many people now won't travel and will uh, you know, effectively, okay, there's event football, but you can, football, but you can make your event hyper-focused and you can add it in there. However, what I would also say is that a virtual tour is not, is not really good enough. It needs to be go much further than that. And the, crystal component of uh, exhibitions is human contact. You need those stands to be manned. Even in the virtual space, they have to be manned by virtual people who are at the other end of a call. There's a great example by a company called Parade. They're an American shopping company. And so cost, time, development, permissibility. Um, going back to that example that I gave you where someone wanted to build a computer game, that you can build some computer games. What if it looks like uh, and uh, Nintendo computer games, as in 8-bit eight, uh, computer yeah. games, like Mario from the old days or something like that. People know what that is, what it should look like. So these guys, Parade, they built a version of Animal Crossing for an exhibition. And so you can walk around it and you can go up to the Amazon stand, but as soon as you go up to the Amazon stand, a guy from Amazon pops up and goes, hey, how are you doing? And you're on a, and you're on a Teams call. Now, the main reason, those are, things are all by the by. I think the customers have asked you for it. I'd probably always say yes to the customer, you know, like and say, <laughs> okay, let's make this work for you if that's what you want to happen. Um, then there's other reasons, but first and foremost, it's an iteration of a platform that you will need in the future and you can build on. So once you've done it, you learn from it, then you can test it, you can refine it, then you can start thinking about, okay, that didn't quite work, let's scrap that, let's add to it. But you're not starting from scratch every time, because if you put these things to one side, all those companies that are iterating, they're gonna be at you know, eight out of 10 on the scale, and you're gonna be down here at zero, and you're gonna have to spend six times as much to catch up than they spent to get there. And that's the general dynamic that we're seeing at the moment. I, I guess the other point I'll put to that is like, the reasons for not doing it, and I understand these things require an investment. Sometimes you have to make the case for like doing these things, and and I, I suppose like what's the main barrier for not doing it? Is it just I actually really just don't like it? Is it personal preference? Because like, I think sometimes that that's always the barrier that stops people kind of going. It's just like oh my god, I can't. 
really can't be bothered with this. It's like, do we, can we just stay as normal? I no, I think for us, um, it's kind of like the other. So I used to work for a company called Rackspace. Rackspace were managed hosting. They were, yeah. like, they were always saying, we'd never go in the cloud. What's the cloud? Never do that. And then they went to the cloud, right? But for the time that they built up their company, I think they did the right thing by absolutely being like, these are our fundamentals and this is what makes us very, very good at what we do. And that, I mean, this is not a, this is not a sales talk, so trust me, I'm just chatting because it's a good conversation. But Cvent, we know what we do, we're very good at what we do and we've opened up a marketplace for other people to also be very good at what they do to integrate with our platform so you get the best. So I think where we've been umming and ahhing is like, what do we know our customers absolutely fundamentally need? Yeah. And then where can other things plug in? So like we were talking earlier about the SAM uh, carbon tracker that can plug into C event. So I think we've just been debating. So I just wondered what your thoughts were, but it, I like what you're saying about iteration. It, it is an interesting iteration. point. And I definitely, I always agree with the notion of like knowing what you do, and knowing what you do really well. Um, it's never a straightforward answer because sometimes these seem to be a bit tricky. Kodak knew what the hell they did really, really well <laughs> until something else came along and they were like, oh, we should have been him in that. So it's definitely good to know what you need to do well, but I would definitely employ you to kind of explore what's kind of there. Understanding your fundamentals, but understanding how your fundamentals apply to the next platform that is inevitably going to come your way and will inevitably disrupt what you currently do. We, we have this conversation internally all the time. I mean, I love, I love that example of Kodak. It's like the last Blockbuster conference where the CEO stood <laughs> up on stage and said, people are always wanna, gonna, gonna wanna go to their local video store, pick up a takeaway, pick out the video with their family and go home and watch it together. That's an experience that won't die. And the hubris of that statement, like, I mean, obviously now we all know, but there's absolutely no excuse for Netflix not being Blockbuster. Like, there's no excuse for that company to have done that. Um, the metaverse is not a threat to you know, your platforms, obviously. Yeah. It, but it's clearly a partner now. The question is, so that exact that question that I had from that client, let's build a metaverse platform. You know, it's like, well, are we any good at it? Do we want to be any good at it? Are we going to invest the required amount of money, time and development skills in there if we're really good at something else? Or can we partner? Can we white label? Like, what's the best approach? And that's yeah. a whole nother strategic circle over here. Is one that we're having at our agency at the moment, at this moment in time, because I would much rather recommend that people go onto a platform with real fidelity rather than something that our development team yeah. has knocked up in six months. You know, that's yeah. that, that, and that's what I'm advocating. And our development team is going, "You're telling clients to do what? <laughs> like, no, we'll build it." And I'm like, "No, no you won't do a good job. Yeah. Like, no, I'm you're sorry. Gonna... Like, you're really good at building websites. You're really good at building yeah, platforms. Yeah. All this stuff." You're not good at computer games, guys. Come on, let's be realistic. I'm sure they're grand. Really. <laughs> very harsh. Right, before we just quickly move to the table, has anyone got a burning question that they want to ask before we move on? There's one at the back. Oh, sorry. Hello. Um, quite a sort of a specific question, but thinking about the blockchain decentralized platforms in particular, if have you seen an amazing event? Have you thought that this whoever this art gallery or whatever has completely nailed this as best as they can. I know that they're not perfect, the fidelities, it can be a bit, but who's given it the best go? There may be one from Sandbox, one from Decentraland, if any come to mind. Decentraland had the world's first virtual only fashion show a few weeks ago. Was it like exemplary? No, but it was great. All the major designers were there selling their clothes there. Um, in a in a specifically designed space that looked like uh, Guggenheim, basically, um, had designed it. So they'd got, they'd gone to a lot of trouble. The best iterations of it so far are happening in computer games, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. If not just the Travis Scott gig, but if you check out the Ariana Grande gig, that was an absolute masterstroke. Climbing up those stairs to infinity, really using and leveraging the power of the platform that you've got in there. I'm yet to see anything yeah. on Horizon. No, I, I've yet to see anything on Horizon. There was there was a Snoop Dogg concert that was a bit weird because Snoop Dogg was there, he was doing his stuff, and we were all avatars were like milling around, and we're like, uh, and and it was the it was the radio edit version. So I was just like, oh man, this is not what I came. If I go to a Snoop Dogg concert, I want to experience everything that Snoop Dogg has. But yeah, you didn't get the smells. No, so I've not seen anything um, yet. Um, but this is early days. But well, couldn't you buy property in the metaverse next to Snoop at some point? 
property next to him. I mean, they didn't, they didn't invite me to buy property yeah. next to Snoop Well, you know, that's, that's, a good, that's a good example, right? So that was in Decentraland as yeah. well. Like Sandbox is catching up, but in Decentraland, Apple bought the space for their headquarters like four years ago, and they haven't, I don't know, what do you call it? Built a pixel? Yeah. Put a pixel <laughs> up yet? So it's like, yes, we are going to have a virtual head office in the metaverse. We've yeah. seen nothing yet. So. I, the, the other interesting thing to this is these are all, these buildings, these are all parallels from Second Life, which was which a lot of people did. There's a lot of investment there. there. I, I'm actually impressed that there's still a lot of energy mm. going on that because you know, part of the, there was a lot of cynics who like Second Life, when that came about, people did exactly the same thing. Um, we'll see. My, my favorite one um, is, again, it comes from a computer game platform, League of Legends, Riot Games. Um, so they're big tournaments that they put together. So they actually created content for the lobbies in the waiting rooms of the games. They created like law-based treasure hunts. And the most important thing, the physical experience, you get energy in the game by eating something called honey fruit. So they sent everyone some real life honey fruit. Mm. Real. They made it and then they sent it to everyone. So this is what I'm, so all of a sudden you've got, yeah. like, okay, I'm going into a virtual space, but here's a real thing that makes yeah. you go, wow, yeah. at the same time. But again, its success and its, and its greatness is based on the fact that it's a computer game platform that's had 10 years and billions of pounds pumped into it to make it excellent. Right. Good stuff. Right. We've got just a little bit under 15 minutes so i think that should be uh, that should be sufficient enough now so carry on but otherwise just a quick round of applause for these guys please Thank you. Thank you.